Well, I slid in here just in the nick of time. Long day at work, but glad to be with you. Looking forward to our time together of class. Uh, we'll be picking up in Exodus chapter 21. I have a little bit different format tonight. Uh, the first part will be kind of like we've been doing. Uh, we'll talk about some of these topics in uh, this, this portion of the law here that's presented in Exodus. Uh, for about the last 15 minutes, I've got a video that I'd like to show you. Uh, unfortunately, it's a YouTube video, so there may be some ads that I'll have to skip through, so you have to bear with me there. Uh, but I think it's a very good show-and-tell version of the tabernacle and all of the furnishings of it. Uh, I'm a very visual learner, so to me it's good to see that uh, presented as it's read. And the nice thing is the guy that narrates it, he's actually just reading straight out of Scripture. So uh, it, it's very accurate in that I found anyway. Uh, but so we'll watch that there at the end. So I've got even less time to get through material uh, before we start that. So if I get to 7.30 and I haven't hushed my mouth yet, somebody please put your hand up. Hey, we got to start that. You know how I'll do. I'll go right to the bell. Before we begin, we'd like to have a prayer. Uh, Chris just told me that uh, Diane, uh, she couldn't get into the doctor, so went to the ER. They did a couple different things, but found out she has bronchitis uh, and gave her antibiotics for that. Um, so remember her, and of course remember uh, Jackie, Sherilyn are both down uh, in Florida. Uh, I believe the funeral was today, so I remember Jackie and the loss of her father and that family. What else do I need to mention? What else am I forgetting? Anything else that we need to? Tyler is at home sick. Been... Okay. All right. Anything else? All right. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Uh, I'll, I'll leave that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight so thankful that we're able to be here together. This midweek study that we might dive into your word a little deeper uh, for this period of time. Father, we thank you that we have the health to be here. Father, we pray for those who do not. We know that there are many who are sick and hurting and shut in. And Father, those who are recently bereaved, we pray for them as well. Your comfort for them. Help us to be a comfort to our spiritual family as well. Father, we pray for Diane that she would recover from this bronchitis quickly. Lord, we pray for Lisa as she continues to go through procedures related to, to her uh, bronchial issues. And Father, for all those who continue to strive and fight against these various physical things, uh, we ask your comfort and healing on them if it be your will. Be with us as we study that we might clear our minds, we might focus on your word, and that we might always strive to find out what you would have to say to us through the Bible. In Jesus' name, amen. So Larry... We spent a good deal of time Sunday with Larry uh, finishing up the uh, Ten Commandments and got just briefly into chapter 21. Uh, just a small, small conversation at the very end there about uh, the laws about slaves. Uh, some of these laws get somewhat deep and aren't really that applicable to us, so we're going to kind of move through this quickly. But I do want to point out a couple things and see if we can answer some of my questions about those items. The first thing that I'd like to talk about, uh, and I don't know if Larry made this or mention or not because I was out counting down the hall, but uh, in chapter 21 and verse 6, this is talking about the slave who has reached the point at which he is free of his commitment, but decides that he wants to stay with that family as a bond servant. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall be his slave forever. Did we talk about this Sunday at all? Okay, I didn't think we quite got there. Somebody turn to Psalm 40, verse 6. Psalm 40, verse 6. And then if somebody else would go to John 15, 15. So who wants to go to Psalm 40 and 6 and read that for us? Okay. Uh, and who would do John 15, 15? All right. Great. Go ahead with Psalm if you're ready. In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear for an offering and a sin offering you have not required. Who is it talking about there?
It's a little tough without the context, right? What was that? God, okay. He is speaking to God. Who is the open ear? Or what is the open ear? I may have given it away by saying who. David is the one doing the speaking. There's, there's a double meaning here, I think, and if you study the context, that'd be more clear, but I did want to point out this passage. David here is talking about his bondship and his yoke to God, but he, this is also prophetic in that it's talking about Christ and the fact that the burnt offering, the animal sacrifice, is no longer going to be required because Christ will come along, and John 15, 15 may clear this up just a bit. Uh, but so think of it in that context. Uh, and if you would read John 15, 15. And who's speaking there? Is it red? There you go. Jesus. Yeah. So Jesus says there, you've gone from being slaves to being friends. See, the idea is that we as Christians are these bond servants. We are slaves to God, but we are voluntary slaves to God. We're not required to be. We don't have to be. We have the choice to go away from God, and yet we've chosen to be that one that's put up against the doorpost and had our ear borne out. Uh, and shown that we have that commitment, that devotion to God as a bond servant. Um, and I think it's interesting there that Christ says he uses the term friend rather than slave. Uh, that relationship is a bit different now than it was in the old covenant. Any questions, comments about that? Just thought it was worth pointing out. Next, chapter 21, verse 12. Whoever strikes a man so that he dies shall be put to death. We may have briefly touched on this when we had thou shalt not murder. Whoever strikes a man so that he dies shall be put to death. What do you think about capital punishment in relation to biblical teaching? Is capital punishment okay or not? Should we think that it's a good thing or a bad thing? God did command the Israelites to practice capital punishment for a lot of different things. You're right, not just murder. What were you going to say? We see support for it in the Old Testament. Do we see any support for it in the New Testament? Okay. Not murdering, which is what we talked about in the New Testament, taking a legitimate life, which we 
Any supporting verses or contrary opinions? So we're all on board for capital punishment. Cool. Okay. Somebody turn to Romans 13, 3 and 4. Uh, that's one of the passages in the New Testament that I have scribbled down here in my margin uh, that may be of some use to us. Yes, sir. Pretty well clears it up, doesn't it? I think that'd be a much deeper conversation and thought process if you were perhaps the executioner, but that's not what we're talking about today. So I just thought that would be an interesting question to ask. Thank you for your, your comments on that, your commentary. Uh, moving down to verse 22 through 24, 25, I guess. Um, Larry had asked specifically that we talk about this tonight and make sure that we covered it. Uh, so I wanted to bring this out. When men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, but there is no harm, the one who hit her shall be surely be fined, as the woman's husband shall impose on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Some people have used this passage to try to justify the act of abortion. The fact that they haven't used it to try to justify the act of Let me back up and, and restate that. Because it's tough. This law specifically reinforces the idea that God has a problem with the act of abortion. How about that? That's a better way to state that. This verse reinforces the fact that God has extreme value for a life that is in the womb. Uh, the idea that part of the Israelite law was the fact that if you caused a woman to miscarry due to some sort of injury that you've put upon her, you're going to be put to death for that. That life, it says, you know, caused her children. It's talking about a miscarriage here. That That is a life for a life. That, that's an equal thing. And so this passage is, in fact, a reinforcement of God's belief or God's knowledge that, that a, a baby in a womb is a life. Um, and that's the point that Larry wanted to make sure we brought out. Um, we know for a fact there are a lot of other verses that are used in support of our understanding and, and belief and knowledge that babies are babies no matter whether they've been born or not. Uh, but I think this is a good one to come back to as well because God here establishes a lot of very good social laws for the Israelites. Some of them aren't anything that applies to us, but a lot of them we can take example from and we can take uh, and infer into what's a good social law for today. Uh, so I think that's an interesting part of this law here. Um, I don't know why. I have very strong feelings about this topic, so let me make sure I phrase this appropriately. I do not understand how anyone could believe that life does not start at conception. I think that's very clear both morally, biblically, and scientifically. Um, and so that topic to me is one that is not a difficult one to know what the right answer is. Uh, but it's been a very big subject of conversation and conflict in our society today. Um, it's a sad, I think, uh, a sad state of moral affairs that that is the case. But unfortunately, that's that's the world we live in today. So um, anyway, one more you can put in your arsenal against that evil that that is people who say that an unborn baby is not a life. Yes, sir. I 
I don't know right off my head either, but I'll definitely look it up. Anybody have one in the New Testament? Uh, something that would be a parallel. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Is that where you were headed? Somebody find that and read it, if you will. Oh, that's that's talking about the other part of the verse there. Uh, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. Uh, right. This is has no basis in Scripture whatsoever. But I like to logic with people when they argue about where life begins. I like to ask them, if I made your heart stop, would you be alive or dead? Oh, they'd be dead, obviously. Now, you know, there's a certain amount of time where you could start their heart back and, and, and ignore all that. If their heart stops, they're dead. They agree with me on that. Okay. Well, when does the baby's heart start beating? And then we get into that argument. So, you know, it's one of those things, again, like I said, I can't, can't even follow or comprehend the argument against it. But this, I think, is another good reinforcement of God's opinion on it, that life has already begun inside of a pregnant woman. Um, yes, ma'am. And there hasn't been a life lost. That's right. Are there what did what does the King James say here? Because the ESV spells it out nicely. It says a pregnant woman is hit. What what is the a woman with child? Okay, so the, the terminology there still is very clearly a pregnant woman. Okay. So you're making the point that in Matthew we don't see the life for life included, just eye for eye, tooth for tooth, right? I think so too. I agree with you. Uh, because the, the context in Matthew is different. I mean, he, he's not talking about what, what a penalty is for something else, but he's talking about physical vengeance versus... Uh, you know, a, a forgiving heart. So it's kind of two different things that you're trying to compare there. Yes, sir. Thank you. 
this man's blood by man. This man is what shall shed. I mean, the, the whole concept of, of murder is bad. I mean, you go into uh, uh, Proverbs chapter 6, the, these six things the Lord hates. Go through with one of them that specifically says, man that sheds innocent blood. Can you get any more innocent than somebody who just wants to steal the blood? Again, I, I think you're right. All this is pretty straightforward when you read those the way you said it. But it, it's just startling how you get you're talking to people who don't want there to be sin. There, there, there you go. That, that's the problem. People don't discuss these things to, to try to actually have a, a reasonable discussion at the end of a thing of time. They want to show that they're agreeing with God the way they want to make you or Proverbs is talking about making God or something. They want to call it God. Here we go. They want to be made with sin. It can be really tough to argue with a brick wall. And that's what you're doing a lot of times with people who refuse to see the truth, because they like where they are right now. Uh, but this can be another tool in your tool bag, your arsenal against people who have sometimes sometimes what sounds like extremely good scientific reasoning behind the evil that they are uh, pushing and the things that they want done. So, uh, And something that we need to be mindful of because more and more it looks like there may be some hope of changing this uh, across the nation. Uh, so we need to definitely get out there and push hard and make sure that we're being spiritual soldiers and advocates for those lives. Yes, sir. We tend to diagnose people with spiritual leprosy. There are certain sins that we consider on the list of, I just can't have them around anymore. We put them in a strange exile, it seems sometimes, maybe even just mentally. Uh, I think this one definitely would be on the list, and you know several others that I could name uh, that would be on the list. Sins that we just feel like are too icky to deal with or come back from. Uh, but we know that's not the case. We know that God forgives anybody of anything if they only repent and obey. So we're to have that same heart, that same attitude of hate the sin, love the sinner. It can be really tough. Uh, that's a good point. Thanks for bringing that up. So I've got like five minutes. So why not bring up another open-ended question? In the context of Exodus here and the Bible as a whole, are punitive damages okay? In the litigious society in which we live, is it okay to go out and sue somebody for punitive damages? Yes, as a Christian. Does it make a difference? Explain. So in this case, we as the Christian would be initiating the lawsuit. That's what I'm talking about. Obviously, sometimes you're going to get wrapped up in lawsuits. You can't help it. it happens to us in my profession quite often. Uh, people don't like the building that was built, and somehow it's everybody's fault. That's just the way that goes. Um, but I'm talking about we as Christians, is it okay to sue somebody, to go for punitive damages?
Where do we find that? Do you know? Because I didn't have time to look it up. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you want to flip back there. Basically, 1 through... Eight or so, right? Nine, nine or so, somewhere in there. Looks like eight will do it. First Corinthians six, one through eight. So if you want to mark that down over here in this section in Exodus, it may not be a bad idea. I'm going to do it right now. Thank you. So this is exactly right. Here in First Corinthians, we're told that if we are if we have a grievance against a brother, a fellow Christian, we are not to sue them. That we are supposed to handle that inside the church not outside for the world to see. That's pretty clear, right? It's just very straightforward. I've been asked from time to time because I've always been a rather laid-back person, um, more and more less so as time goes on. But I've always been one to kind of go along with things. I was the middle child. I'd take the blame in a heartbeat if it just meant it could be done with. You know, and if my older brother or my younger brother wanted to do things a certain way, sure, why not? Um, some people would call that getting rolled over. I understand. I, I get that. But I, my argument with that has always been, I would rather get stepped on than be the one stepping on somebody else. And I think that's what we're told here in 1 Corinthians is to make sure that we're the ones that suffer. It says that. Why Would you not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? It says as a Christian, you should rather be treated wrong and cheated than to cause the church to look bad, than to cause someone to think less of you as a Christian. That's kind of a hard thing to swallow in today's society, isn't it? And the go-getter, I'm on top, and I've got to do everything I can to get to the top mentality that we see in the world around us. Uh, but that's what we're called to do. Any other comments, questions? Yes, sir. And then, yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. <laughs> If it's done in a certain way, it can even be seen as reclamation of what's rightfully yours. Um, that's what makes it so tough, right? Yes, sir. Good comments. Thank you for your discussion. I love to ask those kind of questions uh, because it gets a lot of people involved. All right, for sake of time, we're going to stop there. We'll go ahead and pick up and watch this video. Uh, Jay's in charge of trying to get us through the ads as quick as he can, and I'm sure he'll do a great job, and we appreciate all that he does back there in his little window. Uh, you can go ahead and start it, Jay. Thanks. Marshall McWords from the tower. Standing up. Ten cubits shall be the length of a board, and a cubit and a half shall be the breadth of one board. Two tenons shall there be in one board, set in order one against another, 
thou shalt not make for all the boards of the tabernacle. And thou shalt make the boards for the tabernacle, twenty boards on the south side southward. And thou shalt make forty sockets of silver under the twenty boards, two sockets under one board for his two tenons, and two sockets under another board for his two tenons. And for the second side of the tabernacle on the north side, there shall be twenty boards, and there are forty sockets of silver, two sockets under one board, and two sockets under another board. And for the sides of the tabernacle westward, thou shalt make six boards, and two boards shalt thou make for the corners of the tabernacle in the two sides, and they shall be coupled together beneath. They shall be coupled together above the head of it unto one ring, and they shall be eight boards, and their sockets of silver, sixteen sockets, two sockets under one board, and two sockets under another board. And thou shalt make bars of shittim wood, five for the boards of the one side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the side of the tabernacle, for the two sides westward. And the middle bar in the midst of the board shall reach from end to end. And thou shalt overlay the boards with gold, and make their rings of gold for places for the bars. And thou shalt overlay the bars with gold. And thou shalt rear up the tabernacle according to the fashion thereof which was shown thee in the mount. And thou shalt make the court of the tabernacle. For the south side southward, there shall be hangings for the court of fine twined linen of a hundred cubits long for one side. And the twenty pillars thereof, and their twenty sockets shall be of brass. The hooks of the pillars and the fillets shall be of silver. And likewise for the north side in length, there shall be hangings of a hundred cubits long. And his twenty pillars and their twenty sockets of brass, the hooks of the pillars and their fillets of silver. And for the breadth of the court on the west side shall be hangings of fifty cubits, their pillars ten, and their sockets ten. And the breadth of the court on the east side eastward shall be fifty cubits. The hangings of one side of the gate shall be fifteen cubits, their pillars three, and their sockets three. And on the other side shall be hangings fifteen cubits, their pillars three, and their sockets three. And for the gate of the court shall be an hanging of twenty cubits of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen wrought with needlework, and their pillars shall be four and their sockets four. All the pillars round about the court shall be filleted with silver, their hooks shall be of silver and their sockets of brass. The length of the court shall be an hundred cubits and the breadth fifty everywhere, and the height five cubits of fine twined linen and their sockets of brass. All the vessels of the tabernacle, and all the service thereof, and all the pins thereof, and all the pins of the court, shall be of brass. And thou shalt command the children of Israel, that they bring thee pure oil, olive, beaten, for the light, to cause the lamp to burn always. In the tabernacle of the congregation without the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his son shall order it from evening to morning before the Lord, it shall be a statute forever unto their generations on the behalf of the children of Israel. And thou shalt make an altar of shittim wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. And thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof. His horn shall be of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with brass. And thou shalt make his pans to receive his ashes, and his shovels, and his basins, and his flesh hooks, and his fire pans. All the vessels thereof thou shalt make of brass, and thou shalt make for it a graded network of brass, and upon the net shalt thou make four brazen rings in the four corners thereof. 
and thou shalt put it under the compass of the altar beneath, that the lead may be even to the midst of the altar. And thou shalt make staves for the altar, staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with brass. And the staves shall be put into the wings, and the staves shall be upon the two sides of the altar, to bear it. All of the Lord shalt thou make it, as they were showed thee in the mount, so shall they make it. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thou shalt also make a laver of brass, and his foot also of brass, to wash withal. Thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. For Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet therein. When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water, that they die not. Or when they come near to the altar to minister, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So they shall wash their hands and their feet, that they die not, and it shall be a statue forever to them, even to him and to his seed throughout their generations. And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold, of beaten work shall the candlestick be made, his shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knops, and his flowers shall be of the same. And six branches shall come out of the sides of it, three branches of the candlestick out of the one side, and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. Three bowls made like unto almonds, with a knop and a flower in one branch. And three bowls made like almonds in the other branch, with a knop and a flower. So in the six branches that come out of the candlestick, and in the candlestick shall be four bowls made like unto almonds with their knops and their flowers. And there shall be a knot under two branches of the same, and a knot under two branches of the same, and a knot under two branches of the same, according to the six branches that proceed out of the candlestick. Their knots and their branches shall be of the same, all it shall be one beaten work of pure gold. And thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof, and they shall light the lamps thereof, that they may give light over against it. And the tongs thereof, and the snuff dishes thereof, shall be of pure gold. Of a talent of pure gold shall he make it with all these vessels. And look that thou make them after their pattern, which was showed thee in the mount. Thou shalt also make a table of shittim wood. Two cubits shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and make thereto a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt make unto it a border of an handbreadth round about. And thou shalt make a golden crown to the border thereof round about. Thou shalt make for it four rings of gold, and put the rings in the four corners that are on the four feet thereof. Over against the border shall the rings be for places of the staves to bear the table, and thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold, that the table may be borne with them. And thou shalt make the dishes thereof, and spoons thereof, and covers thereof, and bowls thereof. Covered with all, of pure gold shalt thou make it. And thou shalt set upon the table children before thee always. And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon, of shittim wood shalt thou make it. A cubit shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof. Four square shall it be, and two cubits shall be the height thereof, the horns thereof shall be of the same. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof, and the sides thereof, round about, and the horns thereof. Thou shalt make unto it a crown of gold round about, and two golden rings shalt thou make to it under the crown of it, by the two corners thereof. Upon the two sides of it shalt thou make it, and they shall be for places for the staves to bear it withal. Thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood, and 
overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with thee. And Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning. When he dresseth the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall offer no strange incense thereon, nor burnt sacrifice, nor meat offering, neither shall ye pour drink offering thereon. And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once in a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonements. Once in the year shall he make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy unto the Lord. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, And they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, within and without shalt thou overlay it, and shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, Put them in the four corners thereof, and two rings shall be in the one side of it, and two rings in the other side of it. And thou shalt make staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be borne with them. The staves shall be in the rings of the ark, they shall not be taken from it. And thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold. Of these work shalt thou make them, and the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end, and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. There I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Like I said, I think that probably got through that in a lot more organized fashion than I could have. And as a visual learner, I really enjoyed seeing it put together like that. Obviously, an artist's representation of what it must look like or may look like. Uh, not necessarily exactly what it was, but uh, I imagine they got closer than probably I could standing up here talking about it. Um, one thing that that did not cover that's included in this, this portion of Exodus that follows the social uh, laws and the laws about uh, slaves and that kind of thing is the, uh, the priest attire, the, the garments and the, the items that were made for Aaron and his sons to wear. And so... Uh, hopefully Larry will be able to talk some about that on Sunday and then we can move right into uh, the golden calf um, incident that occurs in uh, chapter, let's see, 32. Um, so that'll be the plan for Sunday. Uh, we'll speak briefly, hopefully, about the priest garments and uh, what those symbolized and meant and then uh, move right into uh, the golden calf. So. Thank you so much for your comments uh, and, and everything that was said. I think we had a very good discussion tonight, and I thank you for that.
He didn't notice it. The little one popped up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 I didn't go to a class. Yeah. 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 Good evening. If you will please mark 947 as the song of encouragement. 947. That's kind of a new one for me, so if I mess it up, y'all just keep going. And the song before the uh, lesson, I guess, would be is number two. This is a new one for me too. 
sing the first and fifth uh, verses. <clears throat> Let us sing. We praise thee, O God, for the Son. got your Bible open. Were you planning on doing the invitation? Started wondering that as we were singing the song. If you would turn to Exodus 14. Exodus chapter 14. Whether Terry had plans or not, I hopped up and so you get five more minutes of me tonight. Exodus 14 beginning in verse 13. And Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. And we talked about this and the fact that stand firm, I believe in the King James, is stand still. And the idea here that Moses is telling them to rely on and depend on God. But we see this phrase again in Psalm 46. Psalm 46, if you turn there now. I'd ask Brother George about number 31, be still and know. Uh, he doesn't know that song, and you know we sing it quite often when I lead singing. Uh, but this passage here in Psalm 46 is where that song comes from. And we'll read the entire 46th Psalm. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress." Come, behold the works of the Lord, how He has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The term there, be still, the original term, Rapha, let yourselves go. Let yourselves become weak. Let yourselves become dead. Turn to Colossians 3. Beginning in verse 1. Colossians 3, beginning in verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. My question tonight is, are we dead? Are we truly living that life that is described in Romans chapter 6. 
It says here, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Just like what we saw in Psalm 46, the only way to let God's power shine through our lives is that we are dead to ourselves. We live in Christ through death to sin. Romans 6 tells us that the only way that we can be hidden in Christ, that we can be part of that new life, is to die to sin, to be buried with Christ in baptism, to have those sins washed away and to rise that new creature, put off that old man. Let's make sure that we're being still and knowing that He is God. It can be very difficult in the world that we live in not to worry, not to stress a little bit. There are a lot of very bad things going on. The news will tell you all about them. They love to tell you all about them. But we know the end of the story. I've said it many times from here before. God wins. Which side are you going to be on? That's something that we need to answer every single day as we live the lives that God has called us to live as Christians, as children of His, as those that are dead to the world and alive in Christ and that hope of heaven. If you have any need to be baptized, to become a part of that life, or to be restored, please come as we stand and we sing. Jesus is tenderly calling me home, calling to of you here tonight as we've gathered to study God's Word, and hopefully each of you have been benefited by it and blessed by your time together. Uh, first off, I made mention of Seth being with us, and he's misplaced a Bible. It's in a book uh, case, but it's also purple inside, I think you said. Burgundy, and has his name, so if you happen to see one laying around somewhere, uh, he wants to get that back. And So if you've seen one laying around somewhere, let him know and uh, We'll get it back to him. Let's continue to keep those who have lost loved ones recently as far as the Conyers family and also the Moody's as well. I uh, want to keep Lisa still in our prayers as she's back and uh, plans are underway as far as uh, maybe some things that will help her. And so let's keep them in our prayers as well. It's coming Lord's Day will be our first Sunday. And so we'll be meeting with the residents at Autumn Place. So if you have an opportunity to be there, at 4 o'clock, and that also takes the place of our uh, front row class on the first Monday, our first Sunday of the week. So a lot of things we can be doing, things that we can be involved in. Uh, don't forget about the uh, list of things that are in the, whatever, the little area between foyer and the Bible class area. Uh, take one of those pieces of paper off and uh, do it. Uh, it goes hand in hand with our community outreach and things of that nature as far as us being servants of God. Appreciate Jeremy and his lesson tonight as far as us wanting to be like Christ and see that we have our power through him. So let's honor and glorify him in all that we do. We would we'll be standing. Luke has our closing prayer. Very well.
one thing to mention about class is uh, Diane Cox has arthritis. Okay. All right. Let's keep Diane and that family also in our prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time in the middle of the week that we can come out and to study a portion of your word, learn more about you, sing songs of praise, to lift your voice. Thank you for everything that you have given us. Pray that you will be with us throughout the rest of this week. That brings back the next appointed time. In Christ's name, amen.